not to take away from this video, but guys, just another reminder that the PMD fundraiser is still going strong. Again, remember, I have a goal of at least $500 by the end of the month. And at the time of writing this video, we have reached over $420. And this is not a joke, we really have. It all goes to support the IAPMD. Since I started this fundraiser, I have gotten a few comments about people People who think they or someone they know might have a menstrual disorder, especially PMDD. And they have been asking for the signs you should look out for. While you obviously need to go to a doctor for a proper diagnosis, the IAPMD does have some resources to help you get started. Typically for PMDD, you need to have intense premenstrual symptoms that interfere with your daily life. You also need to have a couple of physical symptoms, like intense cravings or sore breasts or bloating. Kind of funny I'm discussing something about menstrual disorders during a Spongebob video. And not just any video, but giving my two cents on a theory that's been circulating for a few years. After all, there was that other probably not serious theory that Spongebob himself is a metaphor for a feminine hygiene product. Highly coincidental, yet still hilarious. Now on with the video. Arm yourselves with knowledge. Um, am I gonna get cancelled for this? Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about SpongeBob SquarePants. Or more specifically, wait, there's no specifically. This time, I'm really talking about SpongeBob. That's never happened before. I don't know what to do. Anyhow, happy Autism Awareness Month. Just don't rock your puzzle pieces. Rock your onesies, regardless of the heat. What? Well, they do it in the UK. You guys have been asking me for a video about a character who is autistic. After all, I I do like to highlight representation in shows, except for last week. Granted, I hope to make it up to you guys in May. The problem when trying to find the right character is, well, there's a few, but first, let's start with the biggest. Despite how common this is, none of the shows I review have an autistic character. South Park doesn't count, they were making fun of overdiagnosing kids. Or if the show in question does have a certain character, it's not mentioned in the show or the fans will self-diagnose and then that becomes gospel. Or there's the problem with views. I want to review a ton of shows, but I know nobody will watch the video. I can't really preach to you guys about rap and all that if I'm not going to be able to reach that many people. Honestly, if that were not a problem, I'd probably make this video all about Hank Hill or Norma from Dead End. Or if I got to do live action shows, I'd like to do one about Helena from House of the Dragon. As Spongebob is one of my mainstays, I fought the little yellow dude would be the perfect candidate. For the past few years, there has been a theory circulating that Spongebob is autistic, or at least he lies somewhere on the spectrum. Even Tom Kenny, the voice of Spongebob, has gone on record to say he thought Spongebob was coded a certain way, saying during an interview, I hear so much from parents of autistic kids and caretakers of autistic kids, and this happens so much and comes up so often that somebody should write a term paper on it, that Spongebob in particular is something that speaks to them. It's the thing that they laugh at, the thing they obsess at, the thing they talk about and know every line of every episode. And I don't know what there is in that show that talks to kids that are on the spectrum. I don't know, but more than other cartoons, that one, maybe because Spongebob as a character is a little autistic, obsessed with his job, very hardworking, it's really deep into something. Aww. So that brings us to the question, is Spongebob Squarepants autistic? Well, no. Cotton candy, get your cotton candy, can't throw right that cotton candy. Okay, look, I'm sorry to disappoint you, and I am sorry to disappoint Mr. Kenny, but I don't see it that way. To be fair, I think Spongebob has certain traits, and the evidence for this theory is actually really compelling. But for me at least, every time you name a symptom, it usually has a reason that does not warrant a diagnosis. It's not to say that Spongebob's massive following amongst neurodivergent fans is a bad thing, and I don't want to deprive you guys 
advice of that. Instead, I will run down a list of symptoms and see if they apply to SpongeBob. Starting with a monotone voice. Not gonna lie, this section is a little complicated. Let's start with in general. Yeah, no, I'll give you this. He spoke a little more softly in the earlier episodes and when he has amnesia. Good morning to you, sir. Would you care to blow a bubble? Nonetheless, overall, this does not apply. It's like saying that Beetlejuice sounds like the angel of music. More like the angel of music with strep throat. But if SpongeBob falls somewhere on the spectrum, I am kind of glad he does not have this one trait. Not every neurodivergent person sounds like this. When most shows that feature autistic characters, probably the main way to showcase a diagnosis without having to say so is with the voice. That character will usually have a monotone voice or they talk like this flat and with no emotion like the microsoft background off topic what i liked about norma from dead end is she did not have that i mean i am a little upset they did not outright say she was autistic come on guys you said barney was trans which is good not complaining but norma breaks so many stereotypes you should have at least said yes she's autistic but not all autistic people are like Sheldon Cooper. And since y'all didn't... <sighs> But where are the beast beneath the boards? Altogether, I think it goes without saying that SpongeBob and the word monotone don't really fit. SpongeBob is probably the loudest character on the show. Like at times, I wonder if Tom Kenny has the same vocal mutation as Alex Brightman. Because if he doesn't, I feel really sorry for his throat. As a counterpoint, some people who subscribe to the theory say SpongeBob is not the autistic one. It's Patrick. After all, in the earlier episode, Episodes, especially T at the Tree Dome, he talked like this. Do you mean she puts on airs? I guess so. But kind of like his best buddy, he can be really loud at times, especially after season one when he got hit with the emotion stick and also the jerk stick. Come on guys, I'm with stupid and dumb for part of the pre-movie seasons. What's interesting is I thought this symptom would have disqualified Spongebob entirely. However, to complete this video, I did research to see why Spongebob has such a huge following and what other autistic fans said. It also helped to clear up any misconceptions. To my surprise, I found that this is not a sign for or against diagnosis, despite how often it tends to come up in media. While monotone voices are a trademark, many autistic people often have problems with vocal control, as in controlling their voices in social situations. When they should be talking like this, they talk like this, or vice versa. Now vocal control, that better applies to Spongebob. Some audiences would criticize Tom Kenny for practice like screaming every line, especially after the pre-movie seasons. Could this be a sign of autism? Eh, probably not. I think it's just plain old flanderization rearing its ugly head. As Spongebob went from a young adult with naive childlike wonder to a man-child who acts like a ten-year-old. Besides, for some reason, it's especially common with long-running shows for characters who originally have low voices to be higher pitched as time goes on. On. The mixed results. Infamously, it happened with Cosmo from Fairly Odd Parents, and unpopular opinion, it happened to Bobby Hill. I've always wondered why this goes on. My best guess is the actor gets comfortable enough with their character that after a certain point, it's not even a job to them anymore. It's like whenever they step into the booth, they're stepping into a pair of fuzzy slippers. Hey, that's how Peter Cullen described it, sort of. So let's take a look at other symptoms, such as a very keen interest in certain activities, aka special interests. Alright, this I will admit you have a point for. It's probably the most compelling evidence overall. What you need to know about Spongebob is he has his own interests and he is religiously devoted to them to the point of obsession. Among them include working at the Krusty Krab as a fry cook, karate chopping, jellyfishing, and blowing bubbles like a baby. Or even if he isn't particularly in 
interested in something, he can quickly pick up the basics and become a near instant expert. Except for driving a boat. Don't worry, we'll get there when we get there. With many autistic people, they often hyper over obsess various things, stereotypically ranting about them for hours and hours long after people lose interest, but not realizing people lose interest. It's a dreaded cycle. With Norma, her special interest was Pauline Phoenix. With Helena, it's bugs. Ugh, I keep using these two. I should branch out. Uh, for Peridot, it was Yellow Diamond. And after that interest did not exactly pan out, it was Camp Pining Hearts. Oh wait, I'm getting off track. Back to Spongebob. Let's start off with his habit of picking things up. A good example of this is the episode Skill Crane. For extra money, Krabs gets one of those arcade crane game machines, setting it up for a quarter a pop. And of course, he's cheap, so we likely did not get one of those play to you win type of machines like they have down at the boardwalk. Despite likely never being around a ball game in his entire life, Spongebob finds that he's got a real knack for the sport, winning every single time he plays. What's that clown frown? Oh, you'd rather sit next to lovely lion? There you are, nice and cozy. Wayne Pleasant would hate him. What's his secret? The motto, be the crane. Close your eyes. Quiet, Squidward. I'm being the crane. Oh, that's Ludic Winner! He even has to teach Squidward how to do it properly, allowing him to obtain his sole win. Now be the crane. Be the crane. Be the crane. Winner! Keep in mind, Squidward was so in debt that Crab started paying him in quarters, rather than a proper paycheck, just because it was easier. And he'd probably leverage his house or take a second mortgage if it meant he got to win. What's this? The deed to my house? Okie dokie then, carry on. There's also the Bubble Stand episode, where he and Patrick play with bubbles. And these are not just normal bubbles. After a certain point, they take the shape of various animals, such as giraffes after a bad breakup. <laughs> It's not my fault Oreos are delicious. Now let's move on to the specialized interest side of things. First off, Spongebob's interest in the Krusty Krab is super passionate. He works as a fry cook, and despite having such a menial job, he's pretty much the entire reason the business stays afloat, pun not intended. If Spongebob is away from the Krusty Krab, for long periods of time, let's say more than a weekend or a week even, things will quickly fall apart, as was the case in Who Bop What Pants when he got amnesia and left town. Squidward! Where the barnacles is Spongebob? This place is going down the toilet. Patty's need flipping! Meanwhile, he practically memorized the entire employee manual. The Krusty Krab Employee Manual, second revised edition, page 35, section 19, clause 3A states, all staff must remain on the premises until the day's receipts are fully accounted for. Clause 3B, the proprietor reserves the right to be unfair. He also took it to memory much better than his own boss, the guy who more than likely made up all these stupid, ridiculous rules and restrictions. There's the fine print scene in the second movie. Look, I'm sorry, I'm too lazy to find footage. Uh, imitation Krabs. As part of another trick to steal the formula, Plankton takes the form of Mr. Krabs, building a mechanical robot called Robot Krabs Sponge Chef Pants. It is me, Mr. Krabs, in the flesh, standing right in front of you, with no one else around. He didn't put the brain in the robot, you know. Sponge Spongebob buys it hook, line, and sinker, until Plankton requests to see the formula. But sir, we haven't done the secret handshake yet. Oh yes, here, let's shake. Ah, we don't shake with our hands. Which leads into an hours long process. Six hours later, specifically, it pays off. Gently now. Just as Plankton is about to gain the formula, Krabs arrives on the scene. As Spongebob likely shares Brad Pitt's facial blindness condition, awareness is important, he can't tell who's the real Krabs. Until I know who the real Mr. Krabs is, nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. 
To settle the matter, he starts to quiz crabs and plankton about crusty crab lore. Honestly, I imagine he became a Star Wars fan. And as SpongeBob has the bias of assuming plankton is crabs, he starts to ask the real crabs intentionally hard questions to stump him. If we're discussing the secret formula on the third Wednesday in January and it's not raining outside, after we gargle with vanilla pudding, what do we do? Which, wow, I give him credit. In the end, this does crabs in. Let's see if it's, uh, if it's January with, with vanilla pudding, you... Oh, wait! SpongeBob! Give another chance! So long, imitation crabs! Yes, I think Spongebob has earned the right to decide which fish will be eaten alive by the Elder Ones. Wait, did the Elder Ones do that? I've never read Lovecraft, even though I always wanted to. Then there's also the fact that whenever Spongebob can't perform his job properly, he tends to completely shut down. In the episode Pickles, he is told by one of his arch enemies, Bubble Bass, that he... FORGOT THE PICKLES! <gasps> SpongeBob had arch enemies back in the day. Him? He's the most loving person in the entire ocean. Wait, does Plankton count? Reluctantly, SpongeBob tries not to let the minor incident set him back and attempts to do his job, but finds he can't properly make a Krabby Patty, forgetting the recipe entirely. Bang, bang, I'm losing it! Bun down, shoe, mustard, pan! Wait, you're too lazy to write it down. To help SpongeBob, Crab says he can go home for the rest of the day and sort things out. In typical SpongeBob fashion, he finds he can't do anything properly and needs help just getting home. <gasps> the door! The door! Mr. Krabs! The front door is missing! Well, I mean, Squidward's house is freaking sentinel. I wouldn't be surprised if the Krusty Krab was punishing SpongeBob for his failures. Don't you know how much stuff you can buy with two dollars? By the time Mr. Krabs comes to check on him, his house looks like this. Eh, no big whoop. That's me during finals week. Albeit, in this instance, I don't think it has to do with being neurodivergent. It has to do with a loss of confidence. After all, not only did he mess up, he messed up in a room full of people, including several people he looks up to, i.e. Krabs and Squidward. True, nobody besides Krabs and Bubble Bass probably cares he got the recipe wrong. Hey, they know SpongeBob's a good guy. It was probably an honest mistake. But in the heat of the moment, it's still bound to be embarrassing. I know I put pickles on that Krabby Patty. That two bucks is coming out of your paycheck. Wait! 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 On the bright side, once he regains his confidence by properly making a Krabby Patty, there's no stopping him. However, I guess more of a proper instance is in the episode Bummer Vacation. SpongeBob is forced by Krabs to take a vacation for insurance purposes. SpongeBob SquarePants has accumulated in too much vacation time. And if you don't take some time off, I'll have to pay a fine. Does this ever happen in real life? For SpongeBob, this is uber frustrating because he loves his job. SpongeBob, take a vacation. Aye, aye, Mr. Krabs. Well, that went better than I expected. Oh, it's like Hank Hill. Too bad there isn't a public school needing a substitute shop teacher. Oh, wait, SpongeBob's a fry cook. Uh, substitute home ec teacher. Since Squidward has the supernatural power to burn shakes, Krabs hires Patrick to fill in. Throughout the episode, SpongeBob could not stand the idea of Patrick taking his place as fry cook. And Patrick is not a stranger, that's his own best friend. Simply because he's not doing it the exact same way SpongeBob is doing it. Patrick! You can't do that! Huh? We need to turn up the grill to exactly 298 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, how terrible. Clearly Patrick is going to spread salmonella and E. coli. Patrick, this is no way to treat a Krabby Patty. Okay, that time he had a point. Or what about pizza delivery? When he's so devoted to his job, free DoorDash, caught in mold, that he forces Squidward to accompany him across barren deserts, highways, and tornadoes simply to make the customer happy. Who cares about the customer? I do. Well, I don't. Oh, 
Squidward. Even if said customer deserves a sea cucumber in his mouth. Or what about the episode Karate Choppers, when SpongeBob becomes so obsessed with karate that it interferes with his work, especially since he presumes Sandy will attack him at any moment. Thought you could sneak up on me at work, did ya? Well, you can't, cause I'm fast, I'm mean, and I can do this. After he attacks a customer, and also his boss when he's on the toilet, ew, Mr. Krabs decides that if he keeps doing karate, he will be fired. Shh. No more of this karate stuff, lad, or you're fired. <laughs> Can you just tell him not to do it at work? As Sandy and SpongeBob can't resist doing karate. Do you think Mr. Krabs ever does karate? <laughs> I'm like 98% sure this episode is a metaphor for something, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Krabs compromises and says that SpongeBob and Sandy can do karate at work so long as they do it Hibachi style. Yay, everybody wins. Or what about six and a half hours later? Fine, I will move on to the next symptom because this does fit in with a strict adherence to routine. This is another symptom. Them I wasn't so sure about until I started doing my research. I always saw Spongebob as somebody who goes with the flow, and the only time he ever is super duper stubborn is when it concerns his job, which makes sense. When you don't cook something correct, deviating sometimes even this much, the results can be catastrophic, but it goes beyond that. Probably the biggest episode that people name is Best Day Ever. Spongebob plans the titular event, deciding to spend time with all of his friends, and it has to follow a specific schedule. Go to work, cook some Krabby Patties with Mr. Krabs, then Karate with Sandy. Afterwards, jelly fishing with Patrick. Finally, he and his friends will go to Squidward's concert. Fortunately, Destiny has other plans, and he can't exactly do it the way he wanted to. Stuff comes in the way, then he has to save the day instead of have fun. By the end of the episode, he's at at his wit's end, and he has a complete meltdown when Squidward's concert ends right when he sits down. This was supposed to be my perfect day, but then everything sat down! And everything turned to doo-doo. But hey, maybe this isn't enough. It's just a bad day. I'd probably be upset too if I were him. Let's take a look at his Krabby Patty skills. I already talked about episodes like Bummer Vacation and Imitation Krabs. Now let's get to Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy. I mean, he spent the better part of a subplot trying to teach Plankton how to make a Krabby Patty. And he fails for one reason or another. Nice! Oh, you're off center by 3.6 millimeters. Oh, try it again, Sandy. <laughs> this is getting so tedious. You know what? This kind of fits in with other symptoms, such as motor and sensory problems. One of the cornerstones of SpongeBob is he will never get his boating license. The sun will explode and swallow the earth, and SpongeBob will obtain his boating license long after that. With autism, many often experience motor and sensory overload, especially in regards to stuff like touching or unfamiliar situations. If you want to see it in action, check out the Dead End episode where they go to the fear counselor. <sighs> I wish I could discuss that show. Damn you, Netflix. Now, people have said that an autism diagnosis could be used to explain why SpongeBob can never get his license. He tries to take the test, gets overwhelmed by outside stimuli, and goes into a meltdown, which triggers an automatic failure and Mrs. Puff getting arrested. Oh, SpongeBob! Why? I disagree immensely, mostly because the episode Boating School, aka the first episode Spongebob goes to boating school, they pretty much explain why he was doing badly and why he keeps doing badly. We saw that Spongebob is one of those people who actually does know everything and studies and works hard until you test him. Then he goes into a panic and that's what causes him to fail. I know all the answers until I get behind the wheel. I just need something to help me think straight. 
Dude, I related to this episode so hard in the extra credit episode, especially when I had to take the Praxis too. The night before, I got so nervous I threw up. However, I don't think Spongebob was having trouble with his boating test because he's experiencing sensory overload. He just has plain old test anxiety, which happens to all of us at one point or another, or most of us. Some people just suck at taking tests. In fact, once Patrick started to give him advice for a walkie-talkie, he did pretty well because he was able to calm down and concentrate. Ah! Freeze, mister! <laughs> Big toe. Is this what you're supposed to do when you drive? Hank Hill told me you have to pretend there's an egg underneath your foot. What was SpongeBob's undoing? Realizing that all of his efforts counted as cheating. I do have an antenna under my hat. There is a guy giving me all the answers. It's all true. I'm cheating. I'm cheating. Yo, Spongebob, maybe it's a good thing you did not go to college like Plankton because everybody at college cheats, including the silverfish that live in your shower. They cheated life. You would not last six minutes. Heck, even in no free rides, he still has test anxiety to some degree. At the start of the episode, he failed his boating test with only six points. How many do I need to pass? Six. If it makes you feel any better, at the start of the episode, he had negative 224. Realizing she'll be stuck with walking insurance issue for another year, Mrs. Puff attempts to get rid of him permanently. Extra credit! What was that, Mrs. Puff? He writes a 10-word sentence about what he learned in boating school. He will earn his license. He even gets extra help, only needing to write three extra words. So basically, she took 70% of the test for him. Then SpongeBob finishes the test and has a full-on panic attack. Is it hot in here, Mrs. Puff? <laughs> Why is it so hot in here? <laughs> ah! My hand, my hand is cramping, Mrs. bunch of jokes about this moment, but I won't. Not because I'm mature, it's just that it would likely take up the entirety of this video. I guess in later episodes he still does terribly, but it's a product of flanderization. After all, these plots were practically on the level of, say, Plankton stealing the formula. Fallbacks the writers used when they needed a good idea or a lazy week. In certain episodes, Spongebob does better once he has the proper coping strategy. One episode, he had a mantra, focus on the road. There's nothing but the road. Only reason he failed this time was because he took it too literally. In another episode, he started wearing a blindfold, as instructed by the teacher who replaced Mrs. Puff, at least until he learned that was just a study skill. He would not be allowed to do it during the real test. You can't drive a boat with a blindfold on. That's illegal. But I can't do it without a blindfold. Heck, maybe he just kept failing so much that his confidence took a massive dive, and his anxiety got much worse. Remember the whole pickles incident? Then there's trouble with social skills. Once again, I will admit the evidence is pretty big with this one, even if at first I massively disagreed. Many autistic people will have trouble understanding social cues. Especially understanding what's considered normal, quote unquote. Outside of his hobbies, SpongeBob has a particular fondness for his next door neighbor and co worker, Squidward. You know what? That could probably be a special interest, not unlike jellyfishing. He thinks Squidward is his best friend after Patrick, and Squidward returns the affections. Sadly, Squidward thinks he's as annoying as a bunion at a marathon and wants nothing to do with him. Outside of the occasional joke, SpongeBob never never seems to notice. Maybe he doesn't like us. No, are you kidding? We're his best friends. Surprisingly, we actually saw things from SpongeBob's perspective once or twice. In Little Yellow Book, Squidward steals his diary and reads a section that describes a typical morning encounter. He had some very important news he was just bursting to share. It warms my heart to know that Squidward thinks we're close enough to use the harshest words in his critique. Horrible words that should never be used around strangers. Later, when Squidward is thrown into the stockade for violating privacy. I got my eyes on you. 
SpongeBob doesn't even seem to notice, remember, or care what he did. SpongeBob, oh thank goodness, you have to forgive me! What for? If you want a full-on episode, look no further than Good Neighbors. It's one of the most infamous. Squidward just wants to enjoy his Sunday, his only day off, because he works for Mr. Krabs. Too bad Patrick and SpongeBob want to inaugurate Squidward as president of the Secret Order of the Good Neighbor Lodge, which basically means they get to follow him around and annoy him. Go out and paint all the leaves on the trees! What color should we paint the leaves, your presidentialosity? Oh, polka dots! I'm so surprised to see Squidward does not want to spend time with them. At every turn, they make his Sunday worse and worse, thinking they're helping him. Worst of all, they steal his pedicure. French tips, huh? <laughs> Alright, pal! Make with a relaxing foot massage pronto! Uh-oh. Uh, sorry, your hour's up. Woodward, I thought because of the episode House Fancy, you don't have toenails. Again, I get wanting the massage, but wouldn't a pedicure hurt? Near the end of Act 2, Squidward hits his wit's end and kicks the pair out of his house. Afterwards, Patrick and SpongeBob wonder aloud precisely why Squidward is angry, while Squidward himself is all too happy happy to provide details. Do you think Squidward was trying to tell us something? Yes, I was! You're the worst neighbors! And despite this, they still don't get it. It's like they zone out whenever he yells at them. I guess we aren't good neighbors after all. No, you aren't! Later, their plans to apologize involve giving him a delicious cake. Which, okay, good for them. That's nice. Too bad that Spongebob trips and the cake splatters, and neither realize the severity of the situation. Code red. Code red. Coincidence? I think not. Then there's the fact SpongeBob often has a problem understanding people in general who aren't Squidward. I mean, there was his problem with comedy. Squirrel jokes and ripped pants are two episodes. Let's give a big hand to Sandy! But clap slow because remember, she's a squirrel! One cornerstone of funny SpongeBob episodes is SpongeBob failing to understand people in his naivety, naivety, one of those, leading into Bugs Bunny type situations. In one episode, he gets the Tattletail Strangler in trouble with the law because he littered. It's against the law to litter. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Call the police? <laughs> Yes. You might laugh, but littering is one step away from men slaughter. The slaughter of men. But they're fish. So it'd probably be fish slaughter. The slaughter of fish. The Strangler tries to strangle Spongebob in retribution, but finds that for this one episode, the bikini bottom is crawling with witnesses. Instead, he tries to pretend to be Spongebob's bodyguard, wait until he's alone, and then do the deed, because doing it out in public is not intimate. The bedroom is most appropriate. <laughs> the episode, Spongebob is completely oblivious to the Strangler's motives, or even that his bodyguard is indeed the Strangler. And the Strangler isn't wearing a full body disguise or anything, just a cheap dollar store mustache. Spongebob avoids getting strangled, basically through sheer luck or coincidence being on his side. You're gonna get yours, Tattletail! <laughs> It's not until the end, when the Strangler has to literally spell it out for him, that he finally gets it. The first time, it does not even register. I am! Hey, how'd you do that without shaving cream? Oh, it's a fake, you idiot! Because he continues following the Strangler around town, thinking he's trying to ward off the real deal. It actually takes SpongeBob seeing a mugshot of the Strangler for it to register. I'm the Strangler! <laughs> See? Woo! The Strangler! 
Now for these types of episodes, I like to tell myself that Spongebob's like Wander, as in he knows full well what he's doing, he just pretends to be naive or uses it to his advantage, partially playing stupid to get results. He's a sly, cunning, and crafty genius like The weekend. Hey, maybe a diagnosis could also explain it. I guess this brings us to being literal minded. Okay, I thought this one was a little off the mark, but now I think it does make sense the more I think about it. Many autistic people often don't understand social sayings, taking words out of context, or sayings literally. Spongebob is somebody who follows orders or directions no matter the reasoning, simply because it's what you have to do. It's what makes him the perfect employee for Mr. Krabs, since he doesn't question any of his motives or intentions. See, I told you it's like Hank and Buck. What about the tunnel of gloves? Spongebob's insistence on keeping all legs and arms in inside the boat is what gets him and Pearl in trouble. Well, yes, Pearl helps, but Spongebob did not make it easy. Please keep your arms and legs inside at all times. Um, Pearl, your arm, it's outside the boat. No. <sighs> I will put my arm in the boat. She insisted SpongeBob not speak until spoken to. Until... You're allowed to speak now. <laughs> I bet Mr. Krabs will get a kick out of this ride, don't you think? I mean, he's so tough on the outside. And since this is a comedy, SpongeBob has gotten into trouble more often than not because of this. My favorite instance is Squilliam Returns. Squidward lied to Squilliam and told him he owned a five-star restaurant. Since he can't say, oh, well, we're booked up or something like that, he turns the Krusty Krab into a fancy restaurant for one night only, with SpongeBob as the head waiter. However, there's a problem. I can't do it. I can't do it, Squidward. What? Oh, that's me on Thursday nights after editing, or usually on Saturday or Sunday nights when I have to do voiceovers. Instead, Squidward tells Spongebob to empty his mind. Everything that doesn't have to do with fine dining. Fine dining and breathing. Well, I mean, he's gotta breathe. He's a sponge. How else is he supposed to filter feed? As a result, SpongeBob forgets literally everything except how to be a proper waiter. Sucks to be him, but business is booming. Then comes the Chekhov's gun. I must know your name. My name? And since Squidward is too lazy to just tell Squilliam himself, really dude, you spent the whole episode bragging to him, I think you can do it for 10 more seconds. SpongeBob has another meltdown worthy of Krakatoa. Please enjoy the food! Ah! Would you like some cheese on that, sir? <laughs> Krakatoa! Another big one people point to is Squid on Strike, which honestly is just 11 minutes of Spongebob displaying stereotypical behavior after stereotypical behavior. Mr. Krabs decides that in order to make up for not making $3 last month, I gotta start running a tighter ship around here! Me whenever I look over my YouTube analytics, especially considering this month has a glitch, Krabs decides that in order to get the money back, they'll do something completely different. In lieu of paychecks, Squidward and Spongebob will instead pay him for any misdemeanors. Be it standing around, which is part of their jobs, breathing, sorry Spongebob, or plain existing. What is the meaning of this? Have you gone off the deep end? Well, sorry Squidward. It's a shame your parents were an anti-natalist like Ashley Judd. Out of plain loyalty, Spongebob decides to pay crabs and follow the rules. Here you go, Mr. K. I think this should cover all my nonsense. Oh, and here's an extra 50 cents for when I was tying my shoe. Squidward has to spell out for him how unfair it is, and thinks the only way to get actual respect is if he and Spongebob go on strike. Spongebob is super excited to take part. Going on strike! We're going on strike! I still don't know what strike means, but we're going on a strike! You know, this episode is suddenly funnier to me since on Easter the professors at my school voted to strike, but good luck, strikers. You deserve it. Nonetheless, this literal mindedness is his problem throughout the episode, and practically what keeps the strike from working. First off, he tells crabs what they're gonna do and how they're gonna do it, and that gets the pair fired. <laughs> Hey, could you hold me? I think I'm gonna be sick. 
Dude, grab this Locky. The EEOC does not exist in this world because apparently that's actually super illegal. That he sounds like the president at my school. And to tiered at Krabs, Squidward and SpongeBob go on strike badly. Not a picket fence, you ding dong picket sign. How's this? Ew. How about this, Squidward? SpongeBob, it's unfair, not fun fair. You know what? I'd probably go there, so long as it's not Krabby Land. Squidward takes advantage of SpongeBob's lack of awareness to give his own speech, which I'm sure communists, socialists, and first year poly science students have been using for years. A gentle laborer shall no longer suffer from the noxious greed of Mr. Krabs. SpongeBob doesn't realize Squidward is not being serious. He's just trying to rile up the citizens. Gee, I don't know what Squidward's talking about, but he sure sounds convincing. And this is a bad thing. Later that night, Sponge SpongeBob has assimilated into full-on striker mode and ends up taking Squidward's words seriously, doing what activists never had the guts to do. Dismantle the establishment. I will saw the tables of tyranny in half. No, at the ankles of big business. Part of me hopes the strikers at my school do this, as improbable as it likely is. Granted, in this instance, it works a little too well. Because not only did they get their jobs back, they now have to work for Krabs FOREVER! Or at least until he decides to fire them to save a nickel, whichever comes first. Following the rules. Ooh, I didn't use a clever transitional phase. You might say, I'm not following the rules. All right, this actually surprised me. I had no idea this counted as a symptom. Often those with autism will follow rules to the absolute T, as it's a way to help establish routine and or order. I've gone over a few examples. I guess another I could use is the episode Hall Monitor. Mrs. Puff, with great reluctance, and I emphasize great reluctance, Make SpongeBob the hall monitor. Instead of pretending he's Doc the Bounty Hunter, because I think this was before Doc, SpongeBob spends the entirety of class time giving a speech. Which reminds me of an extremely long speech written by the greatest hall monitor of all time. Friends, students, juvenile delinquents, Lend me your ears. To avoid disappointing him, Mrs. Puff lets him keep the uniform for the rest of the day, not grasping what horrors she's unleashing upon the bikini bottom. This episode really shows just how far SpongeBob is willing to go to follow the rules, and how hard he's willing to force them on other people. <laughs> So I'm the only one scared this would randomly happen to me. Maybe this could support the diagnosis theory. Or maybe not. Okay, time for conclusions. With this in mind, is SpongeBob autistic? Uh, now I will say it's a little more complicated than I thought. I'll be honest, I was originally gonna stick with no, but my research actually proved really helpful. In fact, to make this video, I actually polled my friends and family. If you're curious, the results were firmly down the middle. I'll admit, I was a little afraid to make this video, despite how fun it turned out being, and it helped me clear up a lot of misinformation and stereotypes. Despite this, I still don't think Spongebob is autistic, if only because I don't think the writers intended it. But if you want to diagnose Spongebob with anything, ignoring writer's intention, I think he's more in line with, say, ADHD. People with ADHD and or autism are neurodivergent, and the symptoms often and overlap, meaning it's common to be misdiagnosed. Besides, it's always a spectrum. It's never the same for one person versus the other. However, this video made me enchanted by another discussion topic. Why do we like to diagnose fictional characters? After all, sometimes it does more harm than good, as it could just, you know, spread misinformation or stereotypes. To use an outside example, take Tweak from South Park. Tweak is all but stated to have an anxiety disorder, being worried about getting kidnapped or snowmen coming to life or 
or something like that. Now, I should hate Tweak. He's just a stereotype of everything wrong with anxiety. And he's probably my favorite side character of the boys. If people ask me what anxiety's like, I can point to Tweak as a funny caricature, hanging on the piano and have a good laugh. Meanwhile, SpongeBob himself is a character that's relatable and applicable to most, if not everybody. Even if you find him annoying, you've likely been him at one point or another. Ignoring bad episodes, he's one of the funniest, kindest characters in media. It's no wonder he attracted a huge following. If you're autistic or neurodivergent or anything else, and relate to Spongebob, that's great. In fact, I think considering many of the examples on this list, if it ever came up that he was autistic, he would make for good representation. Ooh, next week is a South Park week. I guess, considering the situation, I could finally discuss Tweak. Don't forget to bring a towel! Oh, fine, I guess next week is another holiday.